you know, I actually had a light bulb moment now. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, Android things, I mean, I was like going to go on my usual rant where like, you know, I blame Google for terrible naming. And I'm like, why would they ever <laughs> call it Android things? I mean, that makes no sense. It's like so common. Like as I was asking you that question. And then when like Don asked like, oh, can you tell us more about the Internet of Things? I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> like, cha-ching. Makes sense. <laughs> From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. Before we begin today's show, I want to take a quick moment and thank our sponsor. I'm really excited because this sponsor is actually a new one and they're called Kobiton. Kobiton is a new mobile testing platform that gives you online access to all the mobile devices that you need whenever you need them. So think of Kobiton as your personal device lab in the cloud. You can manage and access all the devices that you need. And the really cool thing is you can test both your internal and external devices. So if your company has Kobiton set up, Uh, and you have a couple of devices already lying around, then you can hook that up and those also show up in your interface. So you can sort of share this across your company. It's a really cool solution. You know how you always have those six devices and uh, the ones that your users constantly use and you always have to keep testing on? Uh, Well, you can save up on that money and you don't have to buy any more of those devices because they're probably available on Kobiton. You can test devices manually. So they have this cool interface uh, sort of like an emulator, or you can run automated scripts, which is perfect uh, as developers. It's super simple to also just sign up and start testing. So if you want to take it for a spin and see if this works out for you, it's perfect. You can download and install it in just two easy steps. So head on to the link kobiton.com slash fragmented. That's K-O-B-I-T-O-N, kobiton. And you get a 15-day free trial. So if you want to see if this would work out for you or if your company would actually find it useful, then it's perfect. Head on there and they'll know you came from us. Thanks again to Kobiton for sponsoring today's show. This is a really cool sponsor and we're excited to have them on. In this episode of Fragmented, Kaushik and I talked to Rebecca Franks about Android things. I don't know about you, but I find it pretty fun to play with new different types of devices like Raspberry Pis and different types of Internet of Things devices. And Android Things makes it a lot easier for you to get connected and start developing in an Android environment, which you're already super familiar with, being that you're most likely an Android developer. This episode is going to be really interesting because we talk about a whole different bunch of things related to Android Things, building the applications, and just the entire ecosystem as a whole. We hope you enjoy. So Kaushik, I got this new kind of hobby that I'm working on at home, and it's uh, it's not really new. It's, a lot of people do it, but it's uh, working with like Raspberry Pi devices. Have you done anything like Ooh, that? Oh, nice. So uh, at my time in college, I did work a little with it, but I mean, to be quite honest, I've been curious, but I haven't actually spent any time on it. I've I've always wondered like how to like, get started with that stuff. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I actually just kind of do some really super simple stuff i have a monitor set up right now that displays some analytics from a couple of my websites and uh but it's nice it just kind of cycles through i'm gonna have it mounted to the back of the monitor and it's mounted on the wall and it's like i get this little dashboard there that's uh kind of running that's probably not i could do a lot more with it but in any, any case it's it's a pretty cool thing it would be nice if we could actually learn a little more about this in some detail wouldn't you say so? I would have to agree, especially since there is all kinds of new talk of this coming out lately with something known as Android Things. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you? Uh, wouldn't you agree that that would be something good to talk about? That would be amazing, and uh, we have someone who is actually pretty good at this stuff and has been like pushing out some content in this area that I think is pretty rad. So, without further ado, let's welcome Rebecca. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here, virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Rebecca, for folks that, that don't know who you are or any of the background about you, would you mind giving us a little rundabout, rundown uh, about your history, kind of what you do now, and, and et cetera? Uh, okay, so I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa, sunny South Africa, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, I'm a, a Android engineering lead at a company called DVT, where I do... Uh, custom software solutions for different clients and um, 
more recently, or at least um, last year, I became a Google developer expert for Android. Oh, cool. And now I'm starting a little bit more with um, Android things and getting a lot more into it myself. That's awesome. And uh, I remember, like, Rebecca, we met last I.O., right? Yeah, very briefly. <laughs> yeah, very briefly, yeah. And I, I managed to get, like, a quick snippet. So for folks who are interested, you can listen to episode 42, I believe. That's the first part of our Google I.O. So you can listen to, like, what Rebecca had to say then. Today, I guess, what we're really interested in talking about is Android Things. So could you give us, like, a rundown on what exactly Android Things is? Like, you know, uh, because I've been, like, reading your articles and I've been seeing a lot of this pop up online, but I haven't, like, truly understood what it is. So could you, like, give us, like, a rundown for folks who have never heard about Android Things? Because it's a pretty common term, like, Android Things, you know? Um, yeah, so it's Google's latest operating system, and it's designed for the Internet of Things. And you can build basically how you would normally build Android apps. You would build Android Things apps. So um, typically to control sort of LEDs or maybe some um, cameras that are doing some image processing. Mm -hmm. And basically, this is Google's way of trying to break into the, the IoT market. So what is that exactly, before we go any further, what's IoT mean? Uh, so that means Internet of Things, which is quite, I guess, quite a generic term. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it encompasses a lot of things. So uh, IoT is basically any object that you sort of connect to the internet. So um, be it your smart bulbs, um, your Google Home is c classified as a an internet of or a thing of the internet, I guess you would call it. <laughs> <laughs> thing of the internet. Oh, my God. I love that. My Google Home is a thing of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what it is. It's all these devices that are now connected to the internet and that can sort of perform extra functions that your normal little light bulbs or whatever wouldn't do for you. You know, I actually had a light bulb moment now. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, Android things, I, mean, I was like going to go on my usual rant where like, you know, I blame Google for terrible naming. And I'm like, why would they ever call it Android things? I mean, that makes no sense. It's like so common. Like as I was asking you that question. And then when like Don asked like, oh, can you tell us more about the Internet of Things? I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> like, cha-ching. Makes sense. <laughs> so typically with like Android things, right? And uh, and the Internet of Things, as Don alluded to at the beginning of the show, there's like talk about these IoT boards. There are, like, there's a spectrum of devices if you think about it, right? Because there's like yeah. the Raspberry Pi, there's like these small, like circuit boards that like you know we can tinker around with and then obviously there's like more sophisticated stuff which as that comes in with like the smart home kind of things right like google home for example or like you know the smart yeah. uh, light bulbs so can you like give us like where each of these lie in the spectrum can i control all of these with android things is there like something specific that android things is like aimed at like uh, give us a rundown there uh so basically what you would do is uh, start with one of the developer kits so um you can run it on uh, a raspberry pi 3b uh, an intel edison also runs android things and when you're developing you would use one of these boards but as soon as you want to actually start taking your product to market that's when you would go and get like a custom hardware design um using the google uh, support package on top of it and then uh, design the hardware for what you actually lean need so for instance, a Raspberry Pi might have a couple of extra ports in that that you don't need or don't make use of. So when you would want to um, take this uh, this hardware or uh, this Internet of Thing or this thing of the Internet, let's mm -hmm. call it that, <laughs> mm -hmm. when you would want to take that to um, production, you would typically go and um, scale down the board into exactly what you need for uh, the use case. So if you were wanted to make your own replica of uh, the Google Home, you could do that um, and just make it into obviously how it looks, like copy the exact look of it and just mm -hmm. embed a smaller board inside it, if that makes sense. So let me, get, I'm kind of even confused right now. So I'm used to working with Android on like a phone or a tablet or something like this, uh, but we're talking about Raspberry Pi 3, which I'm familiar with, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a board, it's a computer, and I can put like an operating system on it and do stuff on it. So is Android things like this new operating system that I can put on the Raspberry Pi that, that is Android or or what's how does this tie together? Yes, so you would basically flash the same SD card that you would um, normally put like a Raspberry or something on uh -huh. for your Raspberry Pi and you would flash uh, the Android things image onto the SD card oh. and then that runs 
as itself on the board. So when you boot up the, the Pi, um, it boots into an Android operating system. It's a very slimmed down version though. So it doesn't have like um, all the system UI, uh, like your notification bar and your little, um, what's that bar at the bottom? I don't know, with all the- Touchways, touchways. <laughs> Um, <laughs> how dare you, sir? You know how riled up I get with that. <laughs> so, so, so the navigation menu down at the bottom, do you, do you get that at all? Uh, no. So you don't get that on the uh, running on the Android Things device. And you don't get the notification bar at the top. Oh, the, the system bar, bar right now. Yeah, yeah system oh. bar, that one. Okay, so it is Android that you actually get to work with, though. Okay, so that's pretty yeah. cool. And can we, like, for folks like who haven't worked intricately with a lot of, like, these boards, right? So what are the different... Like, the Raspberry Pi is, like, super common, right? Like, that's one thing I'm pretty sure most people have heard about. Are there any other boards that you have, like, tinkered around with? Are there any Android things recommended boards as such? Like, because when I want to try this, I want to get to, like, actually, like, building something quickly, right? I don't want to, like install drivers or like yeah. wonder about all those things like what's the easiest route for me like you know can you have what devices have you worked with uh so i have the nxp pico and the raspberry pi um if you go into the the iot android things website you'll see all the list of uh, supported platforms there um but for me the easiest has been so far the raspberry pi and that just involved flashing the the sd card with um android things so I think if you buy um, the Raspberry Pi through Adafruit or something like that on mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. you might get Android things pre-installed on there, but I don't think so because it is still in dev preview. So you might still need to do that yourself. Uh, that's true. That's true. And that's an important point. Like right now, it, it hasn't like gone released worldwide yet, right? So in all likelihood during this IO, I guess we'd probably hear more about it, right? Yeah, I would expect there's going to be a lot more... Um, announcements there and maybe more some cool demos hopefully got it got it. yeah yeah that sounds like that sounds very google like to do i do remember i'm not sure <laughs> if you uh remember like google brillo right like this was the thing that yeah. originally <laughs> it came out like that's what they called it before so is this like sort of a yeah. rebranding of that or is that is it a little different in some way do you know uh from what i understand i haven't really worked with brillo but i think it is just a rebranded uh so Brillo was uh, developing with, I think, C++, and um, now it's <laughs> been sort of, I think they've sort of canned that project, and now they're focusing on Android things where you do just um, develop in Java. This is so easy, like a target, but I'm, I'm going to try very hard to stay away from it. Let it go. <laughs> it's like C++. I wonder if that's why they had to re- Oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let it flow Interest through you. <laughs> Interestingly... Mm -hmm. uh, C plus plus is supported. Uh, you can do native development now with the latest uh, dev preview of Android things. Oh. You can do C plus plus if you really want to. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder if that's because of like you know like a performance kind of gain that is there. Uh, but I mean, it, if you can run Java, then I imagine there's like a garbage collector or something that's running anyway, right? Yeah. So, oh well. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a good question. So, if if this is Android, that means that I can write Java applications for Android things. Is that a correct assumption? Uh, yes, that's totally the best part about it that I at least find. So I'm not a big fan of C++ or... You wouldn't <laughs> say. Many other. <laughs> um, but with Android Things, you can use uh, all the tools that you love about Android and use them on the Android Things platform. So uh, all the Google Cloud Platform SDKs, um, the Firebase libraries you can use, uh, Kotlin, oh, wow. Rx Java, all of that you can use because it's just a, a normal Android app that you're building. Dang, that that is like that. I guess is the power, right? Like you know, yeah. and, uh, we've talked like in previous episodes, we have talked about like VR and other stuff, and like it is kind of like beautiful in some ways that we can just use this one language, right? Obviously, some of us would prefer it wasn't like Java; it was <laughs> some other language. <laughs> but I mean, even like given all that, like you know, it is pretty awesome that we can just like use this one language and somehow morph that into like different forms, right? Yeah. So let's dive a little bit deeper in here. And I guess the, f the first thing that I think about when I'm thinking about Android things in particular and IoT is I think two years ago, I think 2010 or 11 is the first time I was, I really saw like an Arduino up and, you know, up and I held it in my hands and I, and I was like, okay, this is like this <laughs> little circuit board thing. 
Mm-hmm. And everyone was really hyped up about it. And like, look, I can turn on this LED. And I was like, <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> like, okay. like I just didn't, it didn't find the allure to me. Like, okay, you could turn on an LED. Like I can turn on a light switch. Check it out. Um, <laughs> as so, people are like, sending spacecrafts. <laughs> yeah, as NASA exactly. sending spacecrafts. Like, I got this LED to work. I can conquer <laughs> the that, world. <laughs> that's how I felt. And then, you know, I see these like little things that have like all like, you know, uh, it's, it's like a little rectangle. It has all these holes in it. And I have these wires are going in and out of them. And <laughs> they got all these, you know, and LEDs and resistors and these switches that they're putting on there. And it's like, okay, I don't have any idea. What, I, I know what these things kind of are. But that makes me think of, you know, if we're talking about Android things, um, you wrote a great post on the hardware basics. I'm wondering if we could cover, like, do like some type of crash course on some of these topics, like, uh, like breadboards, like maybe we could start there. Like what are breadboards? And for those that are listening who have never seen a breadboard, if you could explain to them maybe why you'd want to use one, how you would use one with Android things, you know, what maybe what purpose they they carry in the world of IoT? Okay, so a bread so when actually interestingly, before we get into this, I also didn't know yeah. all this stuff when I started. So um it's not to say nobody can learn, because I learned, right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um so a breadboard is basically where you would start your prototyping for your electronics connections and circuits that you want to build. So if, for instance, you have an idea that you want to have um, three buttons that control uh, a camera or they control but- uh, LEDs or uh, you have a little LCD screen, uh, your breadboard is where you would start to plug things in and connect and create your circuits. Uh, it wouldn't be used when you want to go to production because this is just typically for prototyping. And when you want to go to production, then you would um, need to start soldering things together, which um, gets a little bit more permanent. So the breadboard allows you to <laughs> allows you to plug components in and out and prototype your ideas. And so the breadboard is basically like this little pro- like pluggable circuit board that you can kind of just connect things together from what from what I could tell, right? Yep, that's exactly it. It's like wireframing for circuits, right? Like if you, <laughs> instead of like drawing it out, you can just like use this thing. Like, you know, it's like a physical wireframing thing. <laughs> so the, the wires that, that jump it together, I believe those are called jumper wires that, that, that pop everything together. And then we have things known as like resistors. And then we start getting to like some electrical engineering topics here. At what point does someone need to worry about resistors or, or anything like that? Uh, so this is typically when you your uh, electronic components have uh, won't allow a certain amount of voltage through them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. d- disclaimer: I'm not an electrical engineer, so this is just my understanding of it. Oh, well, we're all um, experts. If I get so just, <laughs> <laughs> if I get thing. something wrong, <laughs> um, yeah. So a resistor basically allows you to uh, resist the electrical flow through your circuit. So if, for instance, you have uh, a voltage of 5 volts that's going through your circuit and your LED that you've got uh, can only support a certain amount, uh, you would use a resistor in order to reduce the flow into your LED as so not to pop it, so you don't mm-hmm. like damage any of your components. Oh. Okay. That makes sense. So if, if I understand this right, like I guess there are like certain things. And this, again, like what makes it a little tricky is like it would depend on like the actual component, right? So if you have like yeah. an LED... And like you send like a fire hose of like, you know, uh, amperage or like electricity through the thing, it'll probably blow the thing as you said, right? So the resistors yeah. is to sort of control or sort of like throttle like the flow of the electricity, yep. right? <laughs> Where does the electricity come from? Because like I'm thinking I'm like a complete clutch and I don't want to like electrocute myself, right? So like, <laughs> is there like anything like how much is this KG proof? This KG you know? proof. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> So I've plugged in things and uh, haven't broken anything too badly yet. Okay. Um, I haven't okay. electrocuted myself and I haven't had any trips to the hospital. So that's always good news. That's, that's comforting. Um, so <laughs> okay. that, that means I can like try this out now. Like now I'm opening my yeah. mind to this. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it obviously depends on how expensive your components are and if you're really worried about uh, damaging them or not. But typically if you are going to plug something in, you would want to maybe just uh, read up a little bit about how much... Um, voltage it can take i think is the correct terminology mm-hmm. and then start to calculate the resistor that you would need to use got it and uh, but where does the power come i'm curious like you know do you 
connect this to like a wire socket on your wall? Do you connect it to your computer? Do you have like a battery pack? Where does the power get drawn from? Uh, so what I've done, I'm not, I'm sure there are other ways you can probably connect batteries and that, but basically the Raspberry Pi is connected to a uh, normal uh, electricity from your wall. <laughs> oh boy. And then on the Pi itself, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> This is getting really basic. <laughs> Hopefully it's enough. <laughs> um, and then on the Pi itself, you get different pins that uh, represent different things. So uh, some of the pins have uh, three volts out. Some of them have five volts out. Mm -hmm. And from then you can just use your jumper wires to uh, put power into your little breadboard. And then from there is where um, the power will come from on your breadboard. That makes sense. And I mean, in all seriousness, folks, like jokes aside, please read the manual on this one. <laughs> you're, anytime <laughs> you're playing with electricity, you know, just, yeah, be safe. Yeah. All right. So like you talked about these hardware things and all this is like starting to make some sense to me. Did you have to do any of this when you built like, uh, like a basic sort of like working proof of concept? Like, did you have to worry about this stuff or did you just like plug things in and then like, I'll oh, just like give it a run and then see what happens? <laughs> so... Uh, I actually followed a really good book that I've um, found that came with an Arduino kit. It oh. was like a hardware basics. And at the same time, it sort of teaches you uh, how to plug your circuits in and how to build it with Arduino. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I did from there was just sort of adapted those uh, concepts to use it with the, the Raspberry Pi and with Android things. So for that, that book really helped me uh, learn and understand like the different concepts. Got it. And... Um, from there, then I've just started like looking at, for instance, the Android things GitHub repo. And there they give like oh. a really nice, uh, they call them, I think, fritzing diagrams. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But basically, it's like a, a top head view of exactly what's going on and how you should plug what wires into where on your breadboard. So it's pretty foolproof um, if you're doing like the, the really basic stuff. So you can probably just follow those and make sure you get the right resistors. And um, there's a lot of tutorials online that'll show you like what to plug in where. Um, but I, I do think it's a good idea to understand exactly where and why the, where the electricity is going and why it is uh, working and why it's not. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And we'll add a link to like all the resources that Rebecca just mentioned. And uh, also like to get a better rundown on like the hardware basics, like your uh, the posts that you wrote on your blog is like pretty good. It's like, you know, it gives you like just the right amount for you to like get started and, like, you know, get pretty hands on. Uh, you did mention like the Android stuff, right? So let's like maybe, because in the end, we're all Android developers, right? And that that's obviously the thing that interests us about this, right? How similar is this to like actual Android mobile development, right? Is it like similar in just the Java language or is it actually like more similar, you know? Like can as an Android developer, do I have to learn anything? Because the hardware stuff is something obviously I'll have to pick up. Beyond that, yeah. is there anything else that I'll have to like learn? Like how easily can I get into this? Yeah, are we still using like activities and fragments or are we using yeah. a different paradigm or what? So it is pretty similar. Um, the only thing is that the Android things operating system has got a little bit less things that are available to you. So like I mentioned before, you don't have the ability to send push notifications and anything that generally like requires a, a user interface, you should sort of, um, you can sort of, write that off as not being available. Um, this is probably a very a very general statement to make. But basically, um, with Android things, your displays are optional. So um, when you plug in your device, it might not have a display. So uh, when you're building your apps, you are building with activities. So your your normal Android activities that you're used to, oh. uh, you're, yeah, that's where you build um, your, main, your main interactions with a sort of user interface and I say that with like inverted commas because uh, your user interface might be physical buttons and um, like visible LEDs that you've plugged into your circuit so you would use uh, your normal activities and you can still use anything else that you sort of used to like um, services intent services and obviously all the other Android libraries that you used to oh that's pretty cool but wait but I mean so you say activities which means then like is it actually like a life cycle? Like, do you use the exact life cycle calls that we're like used to and we love so dearly? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I haven't really dived into uh, exactly the differences, but from what I've seen, and this mm -hmm. is an observation, is that because typically when you make an Android Things app, it's going to be the only thing running on this device. 
uh, your app will take pref like it'll just run sort of the on create method and only when um, you like manually like the app crashes or something like that would you get sort of other uh, life cycle callbacks so you wouldn't oh. like really get into uh, the on pause and like on resume happening a lot you know like with normal right, right. Android apps you you're switching between apps mm -hmm. um, but you can install multiple apps on the device but um, and have that sort of interaction so it is up to you how how you sort of develop it but your app is sort of the main thing that will be running on this device. Interesting, interesting. And d d do you know if like even fragments are like available? Do you use fragments? <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I, so I honestly I, genuinely ask. I like know. I'm not like you love fragments. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I haven't tried fragments, but I, I believe they are supported. Um, you so you can just build your normal UI. So if you do have an attached display, like some might, so some might be plugged into a TV or something like that, you can still build a normal Android UI like you would uh, normally build your normal apps. So I would oh. I would assume that fragments are available, but I haven't tested this uh, this hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> now you did say that anything that requires basic user interface input is something that you can consider gone, which makes me wonder. Uh, it w I know that I can use sensors with some of these IoT boards to detect, you know, movement, uh, sound, uh, temperature, humidity, stuff like that. But what if I do want to provide input? Do I need to uh, mm -hmm. use some type of tactile switches that uh, from you know the IoT world to uh, enable those types of those things where I can provide user feedback or any type of interface? Is it supposed to be like a hardware-based interface that I have to actually manually build, or or do you know? Uh, so you can plug in a a normal HDMI sort of, you can plug in any HDMI supported device, so your TVs or whatever, and you will get the normal Android app experience that you have. But your app will take up the full display, if that makes sense. So um, the fact that I said you can forget about displays is actually probably <laughs> incorrect in that uh, only if you want to support that, you can have it. I mean, it's totally up to you what you want to support. So if you your app just wants to have physical buttons, uh, you can do that without having the display. But if you just want the display, you can also do that. Okay, all right. Interesting, interesting. So th let's take this a step further. Let's say we've written some code that, that, that does something, could, you know, flash a light, could read from a sensor. How do I, am I building an APK? And if if I am, like, how do I get that onto the device? How do I get yeah. that onto the Android Things device? And how does it run? Okay, so you would just use Android Studio like you would with a normal app and you create cool. a normal Android app project. And the only difference now is that what you would do is add um, a provided dependency in your Gradle file for the Android Things framework. Mm -hmm. And then within your um, manifest, your Android manifest, you would specify that you're using the Internet of Things uh, or the, the Android Things libraries uh, within your manifest. And then... Um, you can connect to your Raspberry Pi uh, the same way you connect to other Android devices. So you can do uh, an ADB connect via over Ethernet, and then you can just deploy it like you would deploy a normal Android app. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So this is like exactly like the same exact stuff. Like I, I don't have to dabble in like assembly language or like, you know, some low level language. Here. <laughs> this is like just, hey, write an Android app, but just change two or three lines and boom, you have this stuff. Yeah. That is pretty cool. Out of curiosity, do you know if it's like very similar with I other like IoT platforms or I mean have you like looked into that? Uh, so I've played around a bit with the Arduino stuff and the IDE was a little bit I don't know, like not as rich in the support. So Android Studio is obviously really awesome. And the fact that you can use this with Android things, I guess, makes this a really uh, cool platform to develop for. Um, but the the Arduino stuff for me wasn't as as nice. I mean, you can also just push and deploy to it. Uh, but like the debugger and that, I just didn't find as easy to use as obviously the, the Android Studio stuff. Right, right, right. That, I mean, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Like, that's what makes it additionally compelling for us, right? Like, the fact that we are in very comfortable sort of, like, environments. A quick question. I'm I'm just curious. I'm thinking now, like, you know, okay, I have this button that's connected to, like, my breadboard, and I have an LED connected, right? How are the inputs for your button? Take? Like, is there, like, a special library that's, like, added where, like, you have, where it's, like, oh, 
uh, you know, Raspberry Pi button, like dot connect or like, you know, or detect <laughs> if it's like on yeah. or off. Like, how, how does that work? Like, if I had to write this in actual code, what would it look like? So there's actually three different ways in which you can um, access this kind of information. So for the really hardcore people, <laughs> <laughs> you can get access to uh, the low-level peripheral IO, so things such as your your GPIO, so your general purpose input output protocol, mm -hmm. all the different protocols that are normally supported, so pulse width modulation protocols, and there's a whole bunch more um, that are, are really advanced, and <laughs> I'm not an expert in those, but uh, basically you get like access to those protocols if you want to have raw access to these things. So for instance, with a button, you can just use uh, the GPIO protocol and sort of register yourself to receive events when this um, this value on this pin has changed. So you can do it in that way, which is uh, pretty low level. Um, but then on top of it, you can also build. So if you are a hardware manufacturer or uh, you're releasing a sort of a like a, maybe you made a GPS module or you you have one that doesn't have a driver or something like that. Um, you can make your own custom user driver. So what this will do is um, other developers can uh, import this user driver and get sort of events in the normal Android uh, system, operating system. So for instance, like a GPS, you could tie quite easily into the normal GPS callbacks um, that you would normally get from a Android phone that has a GPS built in, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So if I have um, a button, I can also set that up to uh, receive normal key up and key down events if I wanted to. And on Whoa. top of that, so that's if you want to build your own sort of driver, but uh, there's a really, really awesome GitHub repo on the Android Things uh, organization mm -hmm. where there's a whole bunch of driver libraries that are already available for you. So this is gold. <laughs> okay. This is where you go um, when you don't have much uh, information or you don't know how to develop sort of basic uh, or interact with the protocols yourself. So over here, you'll be able to find like a, a button Gradle dependency or um, a LED Gradle dependency. And these you can just oh. sort of add into your app. So you would just say, uh, Gradle, compile, whatever, add the library there. And then within your app, you can just get access to like a button object. And then you can register callbacks and receive button events that have happened. So that's probably like the easiest approach is to go and use the peripheral driver library that's available on GitHub. Oh, that's pretty slick. That Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I want. <laughs> I don't want to be <laughs> writing my own drivers. What am I using, Linux? Or no, something? no. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay this is this sounds pretty cool we'll make sure to add like a link uh in the show notes to that as well i feel that sometimes the easiest way for myself and i think kaushik agrees with me here is the easiest way to learn is just to just do it and kind of get your hands dirty Absolutely. and to be 100 percent honest the one of the the posts that i was turned on to recently uh, that really caught my eye was one that you had written uh, regarding an application that you had wrote that actually monitored electricity. So I was wondering, you know, it seems like you have a few use cases of which you've actually used Android things. Would you mind walking us through maybe a couple of use cases in which you've actually used it? Uh, okay. So uh, I can start with the electricity monitoring one first. Mm -hmm. um, so this is probably the most useful thing I've ever built in my life. <laughs> like, uh, That's the I, I story mean, of like a... every software engineer <laughs> when they actually build the first hardware thing, right? Like, oh my God, I made something in the real so world. So useful. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been battling quite a bit with um, electricity. And so the power goes off for quite a while and I don't know when it went off and I don't. there's no way for me to track how long it's been off for. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when it's come back on. So I could be at work and the power could have gone off and I get back to back home and I don't know how long it's gone off for or if it's come back on. So um, what I've done is I've used uh, Android things, and this is currently running in my house right now, which is uh, quite exciting. Um, so what it does is basically my, my Pi is plugged into power, mm -hmm. and on the Pi itself, I'm running um, Firebase with it. So I'm using the Firebase real-time database on the Pi, and uh, Firebase has this really, really awesome callback on the, um, on the real-time database, which is called the on-disconnect callback. And basically what this does is it sets up on 
the server, the Firebase real-time database server to say, when this client disconnects, you need to do certain things on the server. So in my case, I'm setting uh, setting a, the, the Pi to be sort of offline and I'm setting a timestamp. So you would set the server timestamp and um, what happens then is, so as soon as my power goes off, uh, my Raspberry Pi will obviously power off and then the Firebase real-time database will um, automatically update to say, okay, power's off and it went off at this time. And more more recently, nice. <laughs> more recently now, I've added the support for notifications. So uh, using the new Firebase Cloud Functions or Cloud Functions for Firebase, let me say it that way, <laughs> um, <laughs> I get now notifications when my power goes on and when it comes, when it goes on and when it goes off. So this is really awesome. So I don't have to go back and check in the app and see, okay, my power's off or my power's on. Uh, it'll automatically just send me notifications when that happens. So it sends it to your phone, right? Yes. So I've got a companion app that I, that's running on the phone that's connected as well to this real-time database. And that knows exactly how long the power's been off for. Um, and this app is running on my phone and this thing will then receive notifications when my power goes off or when it comes back on. That is awesome. Yeah, that is like really cool. So step one was basically you would keep opening the app to see like, hey, is my power on? And you'll have like maybe like, a, like an indicator. Exactly. But what you said now is essentially with the Firebase like functionality that they added where like you can send notifications directly from the cloud anytime an event happens. You're saying your app now, you don't even need to open the app because you've written like notification handlers for this very much Android-y app that you have on your phone and that receives the notifications, right? Yeah, that's correct. So it's almost like these two independent parts of like the solution where like the first part is like the whole Android thing solution where it actually like uses real electricity to like figure out like what's happening and the other to like consume that. Yeah, there's a lot of use cases for this type of situation, especially for places that have, you know, power problems. And, you know, I live in, I mean, I live in the U.S. where we have, you know, pretty solid power, but I do live in a rural environment of New Jersey where it's actually quite common for us to lose power. And uh, a lot of folks out here have automatic generators that just kick on. Like, I don't have one of those, but I could <laughs> easily see how you could kind of rig up something, you know, if you have a, an extra cell phone line around that has some type of connectivity maybe that could do something just like this. When it, you know, flips off, you could automatically fire up your generator and, you know, flip the switch. I mean, it's going to be a little more involved, but... There's so many applications of this type of technology. It's it's pretty witty. Yeah, I've I've enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, this is like really cool. I remember when I stayed in like when I used to live in India, essentially they would have like uh regulated cuts, like you know, just to make sure that we conserve electricity at like, at times where like electricity was like a shortage. And like, you know, you would have like these regular cuts and like sometimes some of these places don't. So like if you want to hang around in like a coffee shop for a little longer, <laughs> you know, or like, you know, stay at work a little longer just because, like you know, you have power in those places. I can see like your exact app being super useful, you know, at, at that point. I was like, oh, OK, power's back on. Time to head home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that that would be a cool part. That is super cool. And yeah, OK, so this I'm I'm a little curious though. So a, a large part of what enabled this is like the Firebase part of like the powering down thing, right? Yeah, that uh, when I when I put the two and two together, then I realized, okay, I can use Firebase to do this, solve this problem, <laughs> which was pretty easy to do actually. Nice, nice, nice. I wonder how like how easy or difficult it would be to like sort of emulate that. You know, I, I imagine it should be possible, but yeah, I'm just curious too. Like, see, because anytime you deal with, like, actual, like, electricity and power, like, it's always, like, I'm always curious to see how the events are triggered, right? Because it's getting to the metal, so to speak. Yeah. I guess you can always just turn your power on and off yourself. <laughs> 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 testing. User testing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other use case that you wrote about, and this one seems, like, super complicated and also really cool. And so I'd like you to, like, tell us a little about it. This is basically where you've built, like, a distributed piano right so can you tell us what this is and like oh my god like this sounds like super complicated like how did you wire this up <laughs> okay so this one is not as complicated as it sounds and probably uh, not as useful as the electricity monitoring one um but yeah so this one is basically i have a raspberry pi that has connected to a little piezo speaker so that is plugged into my breadboard and uh, from this point on i have uh, a companion app that's running on a multitude of phones so you can con you can connect as many as you want and basically all these phones are on the same wi-fi network so 
Um, and on these phones, I've got a, a little keyboard view that I got from some open source um, thing on GitHub. And this uh, this piano, um, basically when you press a key, it sends uh, a message via Google Nearby Messages API wow. to the uh -huh. Pi itself. And the Pi just then translates that into a frequency to play on the Pi zone. So um, with the Google Nearby Messaging API, it's pretty easy. As long as all your devices are on the same network, you can quite easily send messages uh, to other devices and receive messages back and forth. So um, that was what this blog post and this use case was sort of highlighting was that how you can uh, use these available APIs already to maybe make something fun or just that they're available on Android things as well. Wow. And I guess like the objective with all of this is to sort of like open our minds as to like what the applications could be, right? Like, and that's like what makes this uh, pretty like slick. Just to step back though. So like I did study mechanical engineering, so I understand what you mean, but I want to like make sure like everyone is like on the same page. So you said like uh, piezo uh, speakers, right? Or like piezo speakers. I'm like, maybe my pronunciation is off here, but maybe can you tell us is. what that <laughs> It has to do with pressure, right? Like it's a property where like if you press something or you apply pressure, essentially it conducts electricity or passes electricity through, right? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all the sort of understanding that I have is that you um, you would use the, the pulse width modulation uh, protocol, which allows you to vary your signal between zero and one. So not just a solid one or zero value that you send to it, but you can send uh, a variable value like zero point whatever. And you can send different frequencies to the piezo for it to play. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Have you heard of any other like typical use cases? Like what are some of the demos that Google gives by default? Like, hey, Android Things is here, like do this. So there's the one that I really like is uh, a TensorFlow example where um, it takes, you use a physical button to take a photo using the Raspberry Pi camera mm -hmm. and um, it uses a, a local sort of instance of TensorFlow on on the app itself and processes the image and then speaks out loud what it sees. So um, I did a demo of this at a, a oh, talk I did recently, okay. but this is really, really cool. <laughs> so um, Dang. basically what it did is take it takes a photo of like a dog. Um, mm -hmm. I had like a Labrador dog and then it would say, uh, I see a Labrador dog or <laughs> I see a, a broccoli or whatever you've got in front of it. It tries to identify and, and classify and speak it out. And the cool part about this is that it's all running locally on the device. So it's not hitting any uh, any of the web services or anything. It's a local TensorFlow model that's been built um, and packaged with the app. That's pretty cool. You know, it kind of does make me, I hear you talking about some of these examples of, of things that you've built and so forth. But as a pure beginner uh, like myself, even though I've played with Raspberry Pi, I really haven't played with Android things yet. So it kind of makes me wonder uh, if I were approaching this as someone who's listening for the first time and I'm kind of intrigued and this is something I might want to do as a hobby to get into it. Where would you recommend would be the best place to start? You know, for example, what board would you recommend? Would you recommend any pieces of hardware? And would you recommend any sample problems to solve, like, you know, check the temperature and it's above 50 degrees, turn a light on or anything like that? Do you have any recommendations for, like, boards and hardware for things to start with if you're just getting going? Um, so I would advise the Raspberry Pi just because of its simplicity of um, being able to flash the new Android Things SDK onto it. Okay. Um, so the Raspberry Pi Model 3B Plus, I think it is. But you can buy that probably from a lot more places and... Um, there's also online you can buy like an Android Things kit. So I think Adafruit or there's a couple of um, different hardware providers that do offer these kits that you can buy with a whole bunch of different LEDs and resistors and different things for you to play with. Um, you can also get, uh, I think it's called a rainbow hat. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. But basically that sits on top of your, your Pi and that gives you like access to uh, a bunch of different sensors and some LEDs and that's a lot easier to program because you don't have to sort of plug things into a breadboard you just put that on top of your your pie unfortunately uh, these sort of kits and um, the Adafruit stuff is not available everywhere so mm. I wasn't able to get access to a whole kit that's um, branded Android things but you don't need that you can just use um, 
your Raspberry Pi that you have and you can use components that you would buy for uh, your Arduino prototyping. Yeah, I think that you brought up the, was it the rainbow hat and the fellow Android GDE, Paul Blundell, showed me the rainbow hat recently. And that was uh, very interesting. And again, for those that aren't familiar with it, with the Raspberry Pi, you can take the, what's called hats and, and set them on top and basically plug them directly into like the Pi. And it offers all different kinds of stuff like buttons and like a little, I think, an LED readout and a temperature sensor, I think, and so forth. So a bunch of different cool things. And like you said, you don't have to spend all that time setting it up and getting it working with the breadboard, et cetera. So it's, it's a quick option, pay a few extra bucks, but it might make life a little bit easier. Oh, that all this sounds like pretty interesting. And I I would suggest like if folks wanted to really like, you know, dive in and to see like what's involved. Uh, I And Rebecca, maybe you have this in your examples, but you have like a very basic LED one, right? Like I would probably start there. <laughs> like just say, hey, yeah. connect, get this light to like flash, like, you know, repeatedly or something. That's usually yeah, I think like that's good. Where- yeah, that's where everyone uh, starts and it's a good place to start just to get your head around it. And then just maybe adding a button. Can I control the LED with the button? And then like throw in Firebase while you add it, might as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. try to control it via Firebase or, you know, just um, play around with it to get to know exactly what, what's possible. Now, just to like step back a little and understand the platform in general, right? So I remember when like Google talked about Brillo, Brillo, Brillo. Blow. <laughs> there was also <laughs> the, oh that's also probably why they changed the name because people like me can't like pronounce the name as well <laughs> uh there's also there was this platform called weave right so there was like Brillo and like the companion platform called weave do you know if like weave still exists like do, would i use this at all today uh yes so weave does exist and it is uh, going to be supported soon on okay. the Android Things platform. So currently right now it's not available, but I believe it is being worked on. And I mean, it will maybe even like tomorrow be launched. Who knows? <laughs> maybe right, tomorrow right. we'll be like, damn it, the, this podcast is <laughs> out of date. <laughs> uh, right. uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, so, so, so Weave is basically what will be used um, to manage your devices that are connected to uh, the internet. So right now, uh, as an example, my Firebase um, electricity monitoring app has no security, which is like a massive problem. Obviously, you don't want to deploy something into the market that anyone can read oh. the data or anyone get that information. So Weave is what's going to sort of solve that problem where um, you'll be able to register devices to your uh, to a certain user or and you can deploy updates through uh, what they'll call the IoT developer console. And here you'll be able to manage your um, your app and the actual SDK of uh, the Android thing, or not the SDK, the, the platform, the Android Things platform. So it's still in development. And um, so obviously I haven't worked too much with the Weave stuff, but it is coming soon. So it is something that you should look and be aware of that that will be happening. Okay, so my application for opening my the like home door and stuff, I should probably not put it on <laughs> GitHub and like release it outside. That would not be wise. Uh, not not yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> you can implement your own sort of Weave service. You don't have to use Weave, um, but it is an option that will be provided for you. That obviously is going to be a lot easier than going through the whole process of making your own backend to manage authentication and stuff. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You uh. This it's very interesting you that you brought this up that that was one of the shortcomings currently, which kind of makes me wonder. This sounds awesome. I'd like, and I'm looking forward to going home and kind of tinkering with a few of my Raspberry Pis and, and doing something different with them. But it makes me wonder what are the current pain points that exist when developing with Android things, if there are any at all. So I think yeah, the biggest thing for me right now is that it's still in dev preview. Um, obviously, mm. so you can't really put anything into production. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing right now. Uh, hopefully, maybe by IO it won't be. I don't know. Maybe I'm just um, putting putting some pressure on the team there. <laughs> um, so yeah. So the the fact that it's in dev preview is obviously a bit of a, a deterrent for for new companies to start trying to actually use it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that Weave is not available. So, um, I mean that is obviously the the device management, and that's like really the sort of crux of IoT. Mm-hmm. So the fact that it's not available yet is probably one of the the problems right now. And I think also the fact that it's very new. So uh, yeah. it's only a few months old. I think it was announced like November or December. And with this obviously comes the fact that there's no 
not many examples online. So with like the Raspberry Pis and the Arduinos, you can pretty much find a lot of content no matter what you sort of search. Um, but for Android things, obviously everyone's trying to build up the content now. So there's not that much that's available for you online. Um, and one other thing is that there's no source yet. So it seems a bit closed source for now. Uh, I'm not entirely oh. sure if the the source will be released. So I think uh, Google still is in discussions with trying to get, like if they, they're deciding if they should make it public or not. So, mm-hmm. I mean, for now there's no source. So we can, I guess, assume that there, there isn't. Um, yeah, and I think some an, another point is that some of the APIs aren't supported yet. So, uh, for instance, Bluetooth, I don't think is enabled yet. It might be now. Um, it depends how late the, <laughs> this uh, podcast goes and the, the releases. But um, so some things aren't available. So I think hardware acceleration is disabled for now. Um, right. But yeah, so some things you might run into that aren't available on the platform that you would uh, hope to be there. That makes sense. I mean, it like, it comes with the big caveat that this is like all bleeding edge stuff, right? Yeah. Which then means things are going to change. So you got to be ready for that. I mean, that's, that's yeah. exactly how I felt when I started doing Android back in 2008. I mean, there was no documentation. Like, there was no libraries. <laughs> it was just it was like this. There was no, you couldn't get access. You could get access to the source code, but you had no idea how to navigate it. So, definitely common bleeding edge type of situations. Yeah. This this makes a lot of sense. And I'm like super inspired now to, <laughs> to actually try this stuff because it's like pretty interesting, right? And I would say if folks have like one of the biggest challenges with these kind of things is just like coming up with like good use cases and examples like Rebecca has, right? So if folks have examples that they want to shoot our way, like go ahead and like send it and we'll try to like share it with everyone else because I think this is this is like an interesting sort of like frontier, right? Like where we try to bridge hardware and software. And it has been done like in the past, but I feel always like the thing that limits us is like, you know, creativity in terms of like the examples that we come up with. So uh, if folks have ideas like, and like, you know, want uh, to like share like some of the cool stuff that they're done, then like, please like, yeah, go ahead and like share it with us. Rebecca, thank you so much. This is like, this is good stuff. I'm I'm extremely inspired to like go and actually try this out in maybe potentially like an upcoming hackathon or something. <laughs> uh, if folks want to cool. reach out to you and uh, get more of your resources, like, you know, wh- where did they find the stuff that you write? Uh, get, tell us like where to like reach out to you. So you can find me on Twitter. Um, my handle is Rigaroo. So R-I-G-G-A-R-O-O. Um, and you can find my blog as well with the same name, .co.za. So there I put a lot of little tutorials on what I'm tinkering around with. And more recently, it's it's Android things-based stuff. Nice, nice. And uh, uh, if for folks, if you want to know why she's called Rigaru, then like you should listen back to that IO episode. She tells us the secret uh, behind her <laughs> name. And rigaru.co.za, that's your website? Yeah, that's correct. All right, perfect. And uh, Don, where do people find like the stuff that you do and like the crazy gadgets that you have wired up <laughs> you can the best place to follow me and uh, reach me is at uh on twitter at don felker and kaushik how do folks reach you regarding all the stuff that you're up to lately uh kaushik gopal on twitter is usually the best way so that's the easiest way to reach all of us uh and fragmented cast is our Twitter handle. So folks, like if you want to like send more resources, if you want to like send the cool stuff that you've been up to, or just want to reach out to one of us, then that would be a good place. All right. Thank you so much for listening, folks. And we will catch you in the next episode. Thanks again, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having me. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode. Thanks again to Kobiton for sponsoring today's show. You know how you always have those six devices and uh, the ones that your users constantly use and you always have to keep testing on? Uh, well, you can save up on that money and you don't have to buy any more of those devices because they're probably available on Kobiton. Head on to the link kobiton.com fragmented. That's K-O-B-I-T-O-N, Kobiton. 
and you get a 15-day free trial. So if you want to see if this would work out for you or if your company would actually find it useful, then it's perfect. Head on there and they'll know you came from us. Thanks again to Kobiton for sponsoring today's show.